Okay, those that are able, kneel with me as we have a word with the king. Our gracious Father in heaven, we praise you for all the blessings that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for loaning us your life and for uh, watching over our possessions and our loved ones. But we thank you most of all for the salvation that you've provided for us at such tremendous cost to heaven. Oh, Lord, we haven't appreciated what you've done as we should. And as we gather this afternoon for our last meeting of the day, we invite your spirit to just throw a blanket over this room to push out all the distractions that would come into our minds. And we ask that you would give us a blessing to give us strength and grace for the week ahead. We thank you for sending the sacred teacher because we've asked it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. good afternoon. This is the most difficult meeting of the day. Your stomachs are full. The room is warm. The lights are dimmed. And what normally happens is people slip away into the land of forgetfulness. So if you should fall, get sleepy in the meeting, I am a merciful, gracious person. I don't mind you sleeping as long as you don't snore. So if you get sleepy, I've learned the trick. I've told the youth at my church, they will never catch me sleeping in church. If they catch me sleeping in church, I'll give them $20. And I've been in church and been sleepy, but I don't sleep because if I get sleepy, I get up, I walk to the back of the church, and I stand in the back of the room. And they, they'll just say, Brother Skeet must be getting sleepy. Here he goes again <laughs> to the back of the room. But we shouldn't sleep in church, ideally. We need to try to stay alert and try to catch all that God has given us. That's a beautiful sunset, isn't it? And you know that the, the Bible says in Psalms 19 that the heavens declare what? They're telling us something. There's a message in the sky. And Jesus reproved the Pharisees for not being able to read it. He says um, that in the morning you say, because the sky is red, it'll be foul weather. Today, for the sky is red and lowering. He said, oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky but can ye not discern, what do the words in the red say? He says, you can't read what's happening. And even in present truth circles, people are not reading what is happening. But I'm here to tell you, friends, this afternoon, that God's spirit is being withdrawn from this planet. And um, this planet is changing its nature. It's been wicked for 6,000 years. But something is going to happen in the end of Earth's history where this planet is going to become wicked on a whole new scale. It's not going to be conventional warfare. Satan is going nuclear in a short time. Inspiration says, the days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being, what does it say? Withdrawn. Withdrawn from the Earth. It says plagues and judgments. These things, it says, they forecast if uh, approaching events of the greatest magnitude. They are strengthening, skip, skipping down, for the glass great crisis. It says, what does it say, the capital letters? Great changes are soon to take place. And we all know that last sentence. But it says that the things, it says plagues and judgments are coming, and they're telling us, it says, of approaching events. As God's spirit is being withdrawn, you're going to see the insanity of sin on a whole new level. Just a week ago, this is an actual photograph of the scene at Twin Peaks Restaurant in Waco, Texas. You can't see very clearly, but on this scene there are bodies, there is blood that was left. And in the, in the, the, the big dispute that erupted in there, they're talking about how did this all start? Because some of the people that were there were not criminals. These were people just meeting for a, for a regular meeting. And something sparked, and it turned crazy. This is a small portion of 170 individuals that were arrested for engaging in organized crime, assault, and murder. I want you to let this marinate in your mind for a minute. You have a group of people meeting, and something sparks, and you have 170 people fighting, shooting, and, and killing. 
That's what's coming in the world. This is a forecast of things that are coming in the world. You don't know who this person is. This is Mike Spence. He's the governor of the state I live in right next door to you in Indiana. And many of you know that just about two months ago, he tried to sign a law that was a law for religious freedom in the state of Indiana that a business person could refuse to serve a person uh, a service that was contrary to their faith. In other words, if you're a baker and someone says, I want you to bake me a cake that has two men on the top, you could say, I really don't want to do that. Go to the next bakery. And you know what happened, those of you that were reading the paper, it provoked a firestorm. Thousands of people came to City Hall in, in, in Indiana, and, this is, um, and, and they brought in the homosexuals from all over the country to come to this city, and they say, we're going to turn this city, this state upside down. And you notice the flag there? What's different about that flag? I'm sorry, brother, just got to edit this out. I have to get my light pointer here. Um, what's wrong with that flag? What's different about that flag? <laughs> Is that the American flag, brothers and sisters? <laughs> I don't know if you know it or not, but whenever a flag is flown upside down, they're saying we are in a crisis. This is an emergency. This is some, this is some out of the ordinary circumstance. The homosexual community said trying to pass a law for religious liberty is an emergency. And they came out in droves and he backed up. The state of Washington said, we will not do business with the state of Indiana. Another northeastern state said the same thing and he had to back it up. They were out there in droves. And it's interesting that they brought Jesus' name into this thing because the people that are going to plunge the world into trouble, they're going to say that they're doing it on the behalf of God. The, the media was putting out propaganda that um, Indiana is a hateful state just trying to get people religious liberty. Inspiration has told us that the things that we see in the papers are telling us of what is coming. Same page we were quoting from, Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, says, the what? Are full of indications of a terrible conflict in the near future. Then it lists a lot of things that will come. It says that there will be murders. It says men possessed of demons. What are we talking about? The world is changing. As God's spirit is withdrawn, people will no longer be under the constraint of any law. And the only way you and I can survive is to have, listen to what I'm saying, supernatural protection. What did I say? The only way we can survive is to have what? We got to have angels. We have to have the Spirit of God in us and angels around our family. That's the only way we will be able to survive. And the daily papers are telling us about this. In a town on the eastern border of Kenya, just what month, what month was this? That was what month? Last month. The Al-Shabaab came to this university and they slaughtered 147 college students. It just, they just erupted in violence. That is what's coming in this country. Large numbers of people killed. I'm not going to take this off of the screen. It was a terrible thing that happened. We know that in Nairobi, not far from Garissa, in, also in Kenya, that they came to the Westgate Mall and they, five men walked through that mall and just shot people in the mall. Friends, it is impossible to prevent that from happening in this country. You cannot prevent people from just pulling guns from under their coats and shooting. It's, it's called asymmetrical warfare. You have an elephant and a mosquito. It's hard for that elephant to fight a mosquito to keep it from biting it. And the only reason we haven't seen these things in America on a wide scale is that four angels are holding back the four winds of strife. And they're holding it back until something happens. What's going to happen? The, it says the servants of God are sealed. My question is, are you a servant? Are you busy about serving the Lord and doing his work? Trouble is coming in the world. And what what is one of the big factors that can keep that trouble from coming? 
What is one of the big factors? The condition of the church. Jesus said that ye are the S-A-L-T. What did he say? We are the what? We are the salt of the earth. But you know what the problem is? The salt has lost its savor. The church is deteriorating. So as we see these difficulties and violence spouting up, we know that the church must have lost its salty flavor. In Desire of Ages 306, it says, Hearts that respond to the influence of the Holy Spirit are the channels through which God's blessings flow. How does, where, how does God bring his blessings? Through the hearts that pr- become channels for the Holy Spirit. It said, Were those who serve God removed from the earth and his spirit withdrawn from among men, the world would be left to desolation and what? It says, though the wicked know it not, they owe even the blessings of this life to the presence in the world of who? You know, it's just because there's a few godly people still left that Satan cannot just take full control of Columbus. He can't take full control of Cleveland, Indianapolis, and New York City because it's just a few godly people there who are allowing his spirit to come through their hearts. But this is what I want you to catch. It says, what does it say there? It says, but... If Christians are such in name only, they are like the salt that has lost its savor. They have, what does it say there? And you know what will happen? Everything will come off its foundations. All of the whole rule of law will be cast to the wind. And any man and his brother that has a gun will do whatever comes into his mind. That time is coming in America, and we have to prepare for that. We have to prepare to get ready for a spiritual blessing. Pastor Yana was explaining to you that in Ghana, they use radio to advertise for evangelism. They use poster boards. They use music and music DVDs to call the people out. You know what the churches in America are using to call people to the churches? Gun giveaways. Here it is, Louisville, Kentucky. Kentucky Baptist lure new worshipers with gun giveaway. What they do is they say, we're going to give away 25 handguns, long guns, and shotguns. They had 1,000 people flock to that church. It's happening all across America. Um, One of the pastors, his motto is, my peace I give unto you. That's his motto, okay? And he's talking about his gun he gives to you. And um, it's happening all across America. Here it is in Missouri, a church giving away AR-15 rifles. They're asking the question, I thought this was interesting, what kind of gun would Jesus shoot? It's a question that Theologians have debated through history. What theologians? Who is debating this? They're saying that these people have been debating this. Here it is again in, um, in Troy, New York, Grace Baptist Church, a free AR-15, and it's packing out the churches. What are we talking about? We're saying that the churches have lost their message. They've lost the righteousness by faith. They're using gimmicks to bring people into the church. That's letting us know that the churches of America and around the world are no longer the salt of the earth. Inspiration tells us in Revelation 13 that this country is going to become, it will look like a what? Like a lamb. But when it speaks, it's going to speak like a dragon. And it's already happening. It's already speaking that way. It's already speaking that way. They have pictures that show Jesus not with carrying the cross or carrying a little lamb, he's carrying a firearm. And notice this, this is what, I took this off the internet. They say the message is, behold, I stand at the door and glock. They're making a mockery of the message of the true witness, the Laodicean message. Our subject for our next 40 minutes, I'm going to race through this. We don't have time for the full-blown study. But our subject is the subject of heart examination in the context of the Laodicean condition. Friends, you, when you get to know me, you'll find that I only have one message that I always teach, and that is how can we get more victory? That's what I'm, I'm obsessed with. I, I study many different things, but my question is how can we get more victory in our walk because time truly is running out? We know that the churches of Asia, Asia, the seven churches that Jesus mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3, were literal churches in literal cities that went in the same order that they occur in the book of Revelation. The first one was Ephesus, 
and the last one was Laodicea. And when Jesus gave the messages to the seven churches, he used a description of things that was in the context of the literal cities. He talked in the language that people from Ephesus, they could understand what he was saying. When he talked to Philadelphia, he used things that were in the literal city of Philadelphia so the people would say, ah, I understand what he's saying. And it's the same with Laodicea. His message is couched in language that the people in Laodicea understood clearly. Jesus was a contextual teacher. He said, I'm going to talk to you in a way you can understand. And what does Laodicea mean? Anybody know? Okay. I'm going to ask you a question from time to time, see if you're still awake. Laodicea comes from two words. Laos means people. DK means justice or a decision. Or it's translated, DK is translated as judgment. And so it means a people that are being judged. Are we being judged right now? Is Christ doing a work of judgment? We're living in this period when the judgment is going on. But the condition of Laodicea, uh, the true witness said, is lukewarm, that this condition is neither cold or hot. And he says, so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, that's cold or hot is mentioned four times, three times in this two verses. He says, because you are lukewarm, he says, I, will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, who said that? Who was the one speaking at the time? That's Jesus. What is Jesus doing right now? What was he doing in the first century? He was in the holy place. And what was he doing? What is the work of a priest? He's an interceder. He's a mediator. And what is he saying? What are the things that he says? He's, he's calling the names of the people. He's interceding on their behalf. He's prevent, presenting his righteousness for them. He's confessing. He's taking their confessed sins and dealing with it. Is what he's doing important? Yes. Do, do we need him to keep speaking? Yes. We do not want him to spew us out of his mouth. But in Laodicea, the literal city, it was a place of, that lacked water. It was a place of drought. And there was no wells. No, there wasn't enough wells to provide drinking water for the people. There were no lakes or rivers near there. And so the water that came to the literal city of Laodicea was brought from a great distance in aqueducts. They had overground aqueducts. These are stones where they actually hollow out the center of the stone and it makes a pipe. And they, it still exists today. And they had underground aqueducts and they brought the water from a great distance. The, the problem, what's the problem with this pipe right here though? It looks like some of our arteries that are people are eating cheese and macaroni and cheese and chicken. What's the problem with this? <laughs> it's got a lot of corrosion. That means that the water they were bringing had a lot of sediment in it. And in fact, uh, historians will tell you that this city's water supply that was brought from a great distance from hot springs, by the time it arrived in Laodicea, it was both what two things? Tepid, Tepid and Dirty had a lot of soot. And if you tried to drink the water at Laodicea just on its own, it would make you spit it out. And when Jesus used that language, then he said, you know what? He says, because of your spiritual condition, I will spew you out. The people there, they were like, uh-oh, I understand what that means. I can't drink. I'm thirsty. I'm going to have a great deal of difficulty. In Matthew chapter 10, it tells us what Jesus is doing. He said, whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess. But whosoever shall deny me, him will I also deny. So friends, if Jesus is not confessing your sins, what kind of condition are you in? You're in a lost condition. So we got to get out of this lukewarm condition. Here it is, 6408. It says, the figure of spewing out of the mouth means that he cannot offer up your prayers or your expressions of love. He cannot endorse your teaching of his word or your spiritual work in any wise. He cannot present your exercises with the request that grace be given you. You are in a loss condition. So we've got to shake off this lukewarmness. We've got to come hot for the Lord. Amen? How many of you want to be hot for the Lord? Oh, man, it takes a lot of effort to be hot, but we've got to become hot for the Lord. Matthew 10 said that if you deny him, he will deny you. And I ask the question, are you ashamed of Jesus? 
Do you find difficulty sometimes speaking up for him? You're in a situation and you really should say something, but you, you hesitate. I know it's happened to me. i tell you a true story. I was catching a plane somewhere and I was in the airport and I went to sit down. And I sat down on some chairs and there were chairs that were, had their backs to the chair I was sitting in. And I was sitting there and I heard, I wasn't eavesdropping, but I heard two men talking. And one of the men said to the other man, he was saying, you know what? The Bible says that there's going to be a resurrection. But I've always been taught that when you die, you go to heaven, and I can't resolve that. And the Lord was saying, John, say something. And I was like, oh, well, I was making all my excuses. Well, that's not really my conversation. I don't, I don't want to be, you know, these guys are white, I'm black, they're going to get mad if I jump in. I, all this rationalization, all I need to do is say, excuse me, I can answer that. But I didn't speak up, and, and God brings us into circumstances all the time when he's trying to show us that a lot of times we are not as bold for him as we, do, as we should be. And if we deny him, the Bible says that he will deny us. I've got to shake off that reserve. I've got to clear my throat and speak up and, and try to speak up for the Lord. The Laodicean message also talks about changing our garments because the true witness says that we, he counsels us to buy of him white raiment. What you may not know is this is a historical book here. It says the city of Laodicea was noted for what color cloth? Black, black cloth that was manufactured there from the wool producing the value. The wool was glossy and black, soft texture almost like silk and became famous throughout the whole region of Asia Minor. It says, watch this, black garments were almost, let's say they're capital letters universally worn by the Laodiceans of which they were very proud. These people loved to wear black back in his day, and that's why Christ said to them, I counsel you to buy of me white raiment. That was like, whoa, white raiment? We are proud of our silky black raiment. And friends, it goes on to say, the historical statement says that the Laodiceans were familiar with the white toga worn by the Roman citizens. To the Romans, that toga was a symbol of victory, but to the Christians, it represented what? That comes from the seven epistles of Christ by Taylor Bunch on page 210 and 211. So they knew about white garments, but they wanted to wear black. You know that in today's society, there's a class of people that like to wear black everywhere they go. They call themselves goths or gothics, you know. And they're, um, by their dress, they're saying, we cast off the restraints of traditional society. We write our own rules about what we want to do. You can wear rainbow colors if you want to. This is what we're going to wear. Isn't that kind of crazy? You can even tell by their piercings and their hair color that they're saying we cast off tradition. We, don't, we are not bound by the rules that are standard. And even on their garments, it'll actually say. What does it say there? That's kind of crazy. I wouldn't even wear anything that said that. Would you wear something that said that? <laughs> I wouldn't. But brothers and sisters, the reason why they're doing it is because black is valued by our whole society. Our heroes, our, 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 um, the, um, the, the princes, the elite of our society, the, those that are the, the kings and queens of pop culture, um, the heroes are dressed in black. Zorro, Batman, Men in Black, Matrix, all these people, uh, uh, um, some of the musicians are dressed in black. Black, And it was the same in Bible times in the book of Zephaniah, chapter 1 and verse 4. Um, the prophet Zephaniah said that he, that God was going to cut off the remnant of what? That's that, that's that nature worship from this place. And God was going to cut off the names of the, what does it say there? Kemarims, Kemarims. You know who Kemarims were? You go look that up in the Hebrew, it comes from the root word Kamar, which means the, an eclipse. And what it was is that the idolatrous priests of Baal, they always dressed in black because they were always in the fire with their sacrifices and in black smoke. And so the idolatrous priests always wore black, which the word, root word is kamar, so they were called kemarim. So in ancient society, those that worshiped the sun dressed in black, just like the Roman Catholic Church, their priests dressed in black today. They, they can't change all the trappings of Catholicism and that, and their visual trappings is telling us about their roots. So in ancient society, when the lead people wore black, it encouraged just the common society to wear black. But I'm going to take a little bit deeper. Spiritually speaking, Laodiceans' black dress comes in many forms. 
Some of it is not even the color black. Because black is talking about their spiritual condition. The black garments of Laodicea is talking about their sinful condition. And sometimes black dress means that you're just wearing super short clothing that's revealing your skin. That's another way of being dressed in black. This, these people here, they are dressed in black. But Oh, they have black jackets, but they have other colors. It's not the colors. It's the statement of their dress that they're saying, we cast off all traditions. We cast off all rules. We make our own rules. We decide what is right and wrong. We dress the way we like. And this is the condition of the whole world, the whole world today, except the true Christians are in this late con seen condition and they're dressed in black. Mind, Character, Personality, Volume 1, page 189 says, dress is an index of what? Mind. The mind and the heart. You know that there are women on their wedding day that they go to a big swamp of mud and they jump into that mud with their wedding dress on. Now, who would do that? Why would you want to jump into some mud on your wedding day? What is that saying? It's making a statement. It's, it's making a statement. You go Google it. Just put on getting in mud on your wedding day. You'll be surprised how many hits that there are. Because our whole society is saying, you know what? The whole concept of I having to be pure and white it has nothing to do with me being married. I do what I want, when I want, with who I want. Me and my husband, we can do whatever we want. And the Bible says that this latency in people were in a condition where they were poor, blind, and naked. But it said that they don't know. They don't know that they're in that condition. What's causing us, the church today, to be in that condition? The number one reason is this. What does it say there? We're just ripping and running. And we're so busy, we don't have time for private devotion with God. But the counsel was to buy three things, gold, white raiment, and I said, because of my time, I'm going to skip through some of these here just to save ourselves time. Let's look at this I salve here. You may not know that in Laodicea, they actually had a famous Phrygian I salve called Collyrium that was sold in the city of Laodicea. And it was known in all parts of the known world. It was famous for this particular eye medication. And that's why Jesus referred to his people today having this spiritual ISAB. Now, you know, the, Jesus is now our high priest. And when he was in the holy place, the book of Revelation was written. That's around A.D. 100. And the description of Christ as our high priest in Revelation 5 is very interesting and doesn't seem to make sense on the surface. John saw Jesus in heaven but when John writes the description, he says that he sees him as a lamb that had been slain, having seven horns and what? Seven eyes, seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God. That was John's view of Christ in his high priestly role. And what it was saying is that Jesus has, in his priestly role, has perfect spiritual vision. He sees the future. He sees the past. He sees the innermost thoughts and feelings of every human being all at the same time. He reads all circumstances just as they really are. He sees everything the devil is doing. He has perfect spiritual vision. And when Jesus said the true witness that we need to have eye salve, something connecting our eyes, he was saying that we need to have that same spiritual vision. You know that the devil is working in all types of ways today. He's working through the entertainment industry through false education, through the false system of healing, through the popular churches. And we need to be able to see the devil's plan wherever he is. We need to have our, our vision illuminated by the Holy Spirit. And in Manuscript Release, two th uh, Volume 10, 233 and 4, it says that when our will is controlled, moved by his will, and our mind controlled by his mind, and our mind is infused by his spirit, that's when we will have the heavenly eyes say, oh, Lord, let me pray for this every day. Help me, Lord, to have that spiritual discernment where I walk into a situation and I can read it just as it is. I can see it just for what it is. And the only way that that can happen is if God's spirit is coming into our mind. It's interesting. You know, I was coming to the sanctuary. It's my favorite subject. When, we all, when you start to study the sanctuary message, you find that all of those things to the true witness are mentioned there. The white raiment, these, the walls of these rooms were covered with gold, 
And so that's where we have to go to find the answer. And there's one part that I'm going to talk about for the next 20 minutes, and then we're going to close. And that's that work of self-examination, because this is something that we as Christians don't do enough of. We don't do enough self-examination, and the more we do it, the more we begin to step with what God is doing. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest cast Lot over two goats. One was the goat of the Lord. The other was the scapegoat. He took incense and went into the most holy place, and that incense was rising, representing the perfect righteousness of Christ and his intercession on our behalf. He sprinkled blood over the mercy seat and before the mercy seat, sanctifying, satisfying the law that was broken and cleansing the room. When he sprinkles before the mercy seat, the blood falls on the floor, and it represents that whole room being cleansed from those sins. But the blood that he sprinkled was not just the blood of the goat. He first sprinkled the blood of what animal? The bull, the blood of a bull. There's two bloods that are sp sprinkled on the Day of Atonement. And the first blood that's sprinkled is the blood of the bull. No one ever talks about that. But the Bible tells us in Re Leviticus 16 why the blood of the bull was sprinkled. Stay with me. Don't, don't let me lose you here. It says, in Aaron, the high priest, shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for, what does it say here? Himself, and make an atonement for himself, and for, what's the last two words? His house. Let me tell you something, friends. The blood of the goat was for the whole nation. Do you want to go out and share the gospel and see people from every kindred, tongue, and nation accept the message? Do you think it would be wonderful to be part of that work of evangelization? It begins first in your home. It, what did I say? It begins first where? In your home. If you want to say a day of atonement, the first thing you have to start worrying about is getting the people that are within your immediate family to awaken to the truth, to start praying for a change in these family relationships. These are the most difficult relationships to work with. It's the people that are close to you who are resistant to the truth. And the, the quality of our family relationships is, is of extreme importance. In many Adventist homes, estrangement and alienation has crept in. We have uncles we don't speak to, aunties we don't talk to, sisters and brothers that distance has crept in. We should address those things. We should go back and confess things. We should confess anything that we can think of. We should work for reconciliation, and we should start praying that God will do something in our family. When God starts working in your own family, it is evidence that you're ready to work outside of your family. And we have to start expecting God to do big things in our own family. I'm praying for family members right now. I'm claiming, I'm saying, God, I want you to, I want to see your hand working in 2015 in my own family. And prayer is the weapon of warfare that will change the most hopeless looking situation in relationships. I wish I had time to tell you some stories, but I have had estrangement from people where if I had never seen them till I got to the clouds of heaven, I'd have been happy. And today, it's been completely healed. What you would have thought could never be healed, God healed it by going and humbling myself and going to this person and, and confess. I was the one that was largely wrong, but I went confessing anything that I could think of that I did was wrong, and I had done some things wrong. And I was forgiven, and we have reconciled, and that's what has to take place in our family. Offering the blood of the bull means that your church family problems have also to be dealt with. As I travel across America, I find that churches have a lot of people that are less than close to other church members. One of the best opportunities to address that is when it comes time to wash feet, you go find that brother which you have issues with and wash his feet. You go find that sister that you have issues and wash her feet. When you get down on your knees, you confess. It will, you will be surprised what a little confession at foot washing will do. And you don't have to wait till the quarterly foot washing. You can wash feet at any time of the year, on any day of the week. You just go to their home with a little basin and a towel knock on their door and say, could I just have a few minutes with you? And you would be surprised what healing comes when you humble yourself to do that. On the Day of Atonement, the priest had a role to do, and who else had a role to faithfully perform? The congregation. Is the priest doing his part? Yes, he is. So where is the failure coming in? We're not doing 
our part. There's very few examples of the afflicting of souls that's required on the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. We have one example in 1 Samuel chapter 1 with a lady whose name was Hannah. It's one of the few examples in the Bible of someone coming to the sanctuary and the Bible actually describing what she did there. And the Bible says that she was praying with such fervor and passion that she was probably swaying because Eli thought that she was what? He thought that she was drunk. When was the last time you prayed with so much fervor that if someone saw you, they, they would think you were drunk? That means that she was pouring out her whole heart for what she was praying for. And Leviticus 16 says that one of our duties is to afflict our souls. And it was done by the whole nation. They all poured in to the courtyard on the Day of Atonement. Well, how are we to afflict ourselves? Here's the answer. Great controversy. Page 419 and 420. It says, on the Day of Atonement, every man was required to do what? Afflict, afflict his soul while the work of atonement was going forward. It says, all business was to be laid aside. Get rid of the busyness. Some of us have too much on our plates. What did I say? We have too much on our plates. Clear that off. Push that back. It says all business to be laid aside. And the whole congregation of Israel would spend the day in solemn humiliation before God doing three things. I talked about this the last time I was here in last July. The first one is prayer. The second one is fasting. Remember that? We had a study on fasting. And the third one is the subject of the day. I actually have several stories in the Bible that talk about the history of self-examination, but we don't have time because I only have 12 or 15 minutes to end. So I'm just going to mention three of them, give some suggestions, and close. But the Bible actually teaches this subject of how you examine your own heart. We'd like to look at a couple of texts on that. It's going to tell us this process that we never study. We really don't know how do we uncover those little dark corners of our heart that we don't see as clearly. Because um, what happens is that um, the number one reason is that we don't spend enough time doing the heart work and just addressing it and praying about it. And then the other problem is that we have blind spots. There's things that we can't see about ourselves. And there's a way to get past both of those things. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, read the words in yellow. It says, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. So first of all, there's something that you and I have to do. And we're commanded, Paul says, to examine yourself. But the second text, Psalms 26, 2 says, this is a prayer. Read the words in red. It says, examine me, O Lord, and prove me, try my reins and my heart. So Paul says, examine yourselves. David says, examine me, O Lord. Why now? That seems like a contradiction. Well, not really. You see, in order to examine yourself, you have to pray and say, Lord, you see me as heaven sees me. So I'm asking you to show me what's in my heart. You have to pray this prayer right here. And the prayer is we're asking for two things. It says, examine me, O Lord. And the second part is, prove me. And that word prove, naka, means to test. You're saying, Lord, examine me and test me. And it's through tests, trials, difficulties that God uncovers the content of your heart. And when you start to look at the stories in the Bible on self-examination, you see that he brings a trial to reveal the, the, to the person who's humble and willing what's in the heart. The, uh, the, uh, the story of Job, we're not going to go through this because we're going to save ourselves time. The story of Job shows that the, his trials came through three avenues, from his family, from his friends, and through disease, that God showed him um, those problems that he was having, his struggles and wrestlings. God, uh, Job was a just man, but he had questions and, 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 and doubtings that were plaguing him, and God, through his family and his friends, and the disease process, he caused him to do some heart searching. Another story of self-examination, who's this here? Samson. That's the story of Samson. 
And his life teaches that repetitive sin will cause literal and spiritual blindness. And so if you're doing something repeatedly over and over, you must stop it. You must make a valiant effort to break this pattern. You know, sin is an addiction. You're aware of that. Sin is an addiction. It comes in many different forms. And you cannot break an addiction of your own power. You have to get strength from above. We know that um, by the time he reached the latter part of his life, he could not, could not even read that this lady was planning to bind him and take his life. Even though she was telling her lies, the men would come out, and the Bible says that he would snap the ropes as if they were threads. That means that there was a threat there, and he actually had to, to shake himself. And, but even when he was doing that, he didn't. He thought it was a joke. He was completely blind to his situation. And in the end, he was destroyed. And the Bible talks about that. This is a Bible text here. This is actually Proverbs. It says that um, the person that, does, that lacks wisdom says, go with after her straightway as an ox go to the slaughter, as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dark strike through his liver. And it says, and knoweth not. See, the, the, the fool actually doesn't even realize that they're going down the path. And that's you and me when we keep repeating the same mistake over and over. And when God brings that to our attention, we have to do something to, to uh, arrest it. But God gave Samson an opportunity for self-examination. And the Bible says that God caused his physical condition to mirror his spiritual condition. And his eyes were actually removed from him. But notice the Bible says that he was put to do what? What does it say here? Grind, Grind in the prison house. That's the operative phrase in this text. Because in, in those times, the prison house grounding was done around a wheel. Around a wheel. And so listen to this. God, this is a story about self-examination. God says, you know what? You've been just going down this path, going down this path. This is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to put you in darkness. No distractions now. You're not going to see any more women anymore. You can't even see them anymore. And I'm going to cause you to walk around the same ground over and over till you learn your lesson. And it says in the book My Life Today on page 92, the Lord brings his children over what? Read it for me. Again and again, increasing the pressure until perfect humility fills the mind and the character is transformed. And so when you find that you're doing the same thing, that you fly off and get angry, and you keep flying off again, you've got to focus on this and say, you know what? This area right here, God, you keep bringing me back to this. I'm going to get the victory over this thing through strength in you. The third story on self-examination uh, that we're going to just touch on before our practical suggestions is the story of, who is this here? Who called down fire from heaven? That was Elijah. And his story teaches us that one of the big lessons to be learned in self-examination is that we should be praying that self will be crucified. Self will be crucified. Brother Skeet, where did you get that from? I never heard that before. Remember that when he had his big showdown on, on uh, Mount Carmel? After that showdown, God told him, up, oh, go, I'm going to send rain. And he went to go and to pray for something God had promised. That's us. Has God promised us many things? We still need to pray for those things that God has promised for. You ever wonder what he was praying? You think that he would just say, Lord, send rain. Wasn't that what you would say? God, you promised it. You said it's time for me to pray for, uh, time for rain to come. Lord, send rain. Why? But did, did Elijah's prayer get answered immediately? What did he do? He prayed, and then what did he do? He, he sent the servant to go do what? To go do what? To go look for a cloud. And how many times did he do that? And, why, and what was going on while he was doing that? What was going on in Elijah's prayer? Here it is. This inspiration says, The servant watched while Elijah prayed. Six times he returned from the watch saying, There is nothing, no cloud, no sign, or rain. But the prophet did not give up in discouragement. He kept, what does it say here? To see where he had failed to honor God. He what? His sins. And thus continued to what? That's what we're supposed to be doing on the Day of Atonement. I'm going to stop right there. You have to do two things. Keep reviewing your life 
and S. Things come to mind. Say, Lord, I'm sorry for doing that. Please take it from me. I'm sorry for doing that. Please cleanse that out of me. Take that away from me. It says that while watching for a token that his prayer was answered, he searched his heart. And look at this here. And seemed to be, what does it say there? Less and less, both in his own estimation and in the sight of God. Do you know that whenever God does something really good for you, the tendency is for us to do this. We say, look what God did. We, we puff up a little bit. Look what God did for me. And what happens is a little sometimes, a little bit of hint of you becoming proud or boastful. And, and, and when, when God had done that miraculous thing that had not been done where a man called fire from heaven in front of a whole nation, in his heart perhaps there was something like, look what God did for me. And God said, before I can send the rain, that has to be all out of you. It says that as he kept praying and searching his heart, he seemed to become less and less in his own estimation in the sight of God. It seemed to him that he was, what's the next word? Nothing. Nothing. And that God was, the next word says what? Everything. Everything. And when he reached the point of, what does it say there? Renouncing self. It says the answer came, friends. This is a uh, a wonderful, wonderful, inspired description of what we need to be doing right now. We need to be saying, Lord, let self be completely expunged. Let there be none, no pride in my opinion. Let me be humble. Let me let everyone go in front of me. Let me be the last, not, not try to be elbowing for attention. Let me not do things to attract attention to myself. Let me just be nothing and you everything. And when we start praying along that end, our hearts will begin to be cleansed in a mighty way. That's 2 BC, page 1035. I'm going to close out. I have five minutes left with some practical suggestions. If you want to do heart examination, it first begins at your devotional time. You study your Bible, and then while you're praying, part of your prayer time is, Lord, examine me, O Lord. Try my reins in my heart. Show me myself. You ask God in Testimonies, Volume 1, on page 260 and 261, it says we should cry out to God for a true knowledge of ourselves. So we, in your prayer life, you have to ask God to show you where your defect. And brothers and sisters, if you pray that a few days in a row, it, something will come to your mind just as clear as someone's talking to you. And the Lord will say, this is really, sister, a problem that you have that you need to address. He'll say, Lord, the Lord will say, brother, you got a problem right here. Just give it a little attention and I'll take care of it. So it's in the devotional time, while you're in the attitude of prayer, you're asking God to reveal to you those defects of character. You should also ask the people around you, the people that know you best. It could be your spouse, it could be your children, it could be a brother or sister that you're close, it could be a very good friend. You should sit with them and just ask them, I would like for you to tell me the truth. What are a couple of things that you, see I, that, that you see that I really need to work on? And if they're a person that really cares for you, they can tell you things that you haven't thought about recently. Some of the things they'll say, you'll say, I know. And other things you'll say, hmm, I didn't know that was so pronounced in my character. So sometimes, in order to get around the blind spot, you have to ask someone who knows you to tell you. Spouses are really good at that. <laughs> Husband or wife, if they could go to their spouse in a quiet moment and just say, I, I really have a, a question for you, sweetheart. I, I'd like you to be brutally honest. Just, just give me a list of one, two, or three things that I, I really need to work on in my character. And they can help you navigate around those blind spots. Another very important thing, if you want to have your heart clean, completely clean before God, is you have to address your emotions. You know that saints got emotional issues? Did you know that? Saints be having some emotional issues. And the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy talk about these sinful emotions that um, drive so many thoughts and behaviors and words. And the Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 20 that the wrath of God worketh, what's the next word? The wrath of man worketh what? Not. not. The righteous of God. You know, people that tend to get hot really quick, you're not going to progress 
up the ladder of sanctification. And you know, it's interesting, people that get angry, some of them only get angry on certain situations. I am extremely patient with adults, but you put some bad kids around me and it's just getting me stressed. I just get stressed. There's something about bad little kids that just, whoa, whoa, whoa. It just touches the nerve. But if I was an adult and they're, they're messing up, I can just be just as calm and cool. But I get about a little six or seven year old that's, that's fighting with them. Mommy, no, I ain't gonna. That's just like, whoa. I'm just like, you need to deal with, you need to deal with him, <laughs> you know? And God has allowed for us to have certain deficiencies where in certain situations it brings out our nature. It brings out some of our problems. Some of us are prone to grief and despondency. Instead of red hot emotions, we're more the bluer emotions are. We get discouraged easily and these things are actually working against righteousness. One inspired statement says that gloom and despondency, when you settle down in them, it's actually a sin. In Ministry of Healing, it says that grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, all tend to do what? Break down the life forces. We should be good stewards of our emotional state. We should be the first three, fruit of the Spirit, are what? The first three. Love, joy, and peace. We, these are the ones, early writing says, that cannot be counterfeited by Satan. So we should be praying daily to have more love for souls. People that we don't even know say, Lord, teach me to love people that I just bump into, that I don't even know them. We should cultivate joy. Everybody smile. Give me a big smile. Big smile, big smile. Let me see your teeth. We should cultivate that. We should cultivate cheerfulness. Because you know, a cheerful person is easy to be around. And some of us are just a little bit too somber, a little bit too down. But if you have the spirit, we should be happy because you know what? Jesus has done a lot for us. And if we're faithful, we're going to blast off from this place and go to heaven for a very long time. And the Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard the things that God has provided for us. So we should be of all people joyful. When we go to share and knock on the door and talk to people, and they're hostile to us. Our attitude should not be anger, it should be pity. We should be saying, we should have the attitude of someone that's going door to door offering a million dollars to a stranger. And when they come to the door and they say, I don't wanna hear, our attitude shouldn't be anger, we should be saying, you really don't know what you're turning. It shouldn't make us angry at all. We should be saying, I have something that the Bible has said is of tremendous value and I'm disappointed, but I'm going to come back because you don't really know what you're missing. We come to the close of our study this afternoon. A young man said, please don't go as long as the previous speaker. And I kept my word. Laodicea is the church of judgment. The church that's name is going to come up before God. The whole world, friends, and even the church is dressed in black, just like ancient Laodicea. You can see it. You can just read people's minds by just looking at how they're dressed and our whole world is going towards the service of self and those that don't get that white raiment those that don't have christ transform them their prayers will be spewed forth out of christ's mouth just as the dirty tepid water was spewed forth of the mouth of the ancient laodiceans lord has promised that he will represent us before the great accuser of the brethren you know that Satan stands, we know in Job chapter 1, bringing accusations against God's people. But we don't have to fear anything. With our high priest as our great intercessor, he says that he will stand in our account. The mission field that we are called to go and work on is full of landmines. Everywhere you go in our society, there are temptations. And you cannot walk through this life unscathed if you have a blindfold on. We really need to have our spiritual vision restored. It's impossible for you to make it to heaven without the Holy Spirit in your mind giving you this tremendous spiritual vision. You trying to witness to people and try to hit the target and say just the right thing, you cannot say the right thing. It's impossible for you to hit the target unless the Holy Spirit is giving you the words. He's telling you what to say. He's telling you when to be quiet and say nothing and let him work 
as a supernatural detergent on that heart. I've learned that with my own children. Sometimes as their father, I just have to be quiet and pray. I can't continually be trying to correct them because they're adults now. And I have to pray. And the Lord has been working. The Lord has put questions in their mind to speak to me. Then it's time for me to speak. And if we want to learn to witness effectively, we cannot do it blindfolded. We must have that spiritual eye salve. We must, like Elijah, pray that rain will come. But while we're praying that, we should be searching our own hearts and saying, Lord, that there be less and less of self and more and more of thee. And when self is fully renounced, the Bible says rain will come. Isn't that be marvelous? Won't you, won't you want to have that early rain today? And be on the side that when the latter rain is pouring out and that supernatural protection is spread before God's people, that you will be part of that people. If that's your desire, kneel with me as we close out in prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we see that the whole world, including North America, Africa, and Asia, South America, Australia, Antarctica, and the North Pole, are in a Laodicean condition. Lord, we're living in a time of judgment, and we don't want to have our prayers spewed out of your mouth. Oh, Lord, we pray right now that we will not be proud of our own black garments, but that you will clothe us in your spotless shining character. We pray right now, Lord, that you would give us that goal, which is faith that works by love. Help us to love those that are unlovely and those that have spoken harshly to us. Help us to have a forgiving heart that we might have that spiritual goal that is of such great price to heaven. And we ask that you would give each in this room a little bit more of that heavenly spiritual eye salve. Lord, we need to be able to read situations we need to know when we get in our car, when you want us to turn around, go back home, or, or, or not go the road that, you, that we go all the time. We want to be able to have our minds subtly led by that still, small voice. And I pray for everyone that raised their hand here this evening that you as a true witness will teach us how to do this work of heart examination. Because those that are engaged in prayer, fasting, and deep searching of heart are doing the work that you have required of us in this late hour. Lord, the newspapers are telling us that your coming is not far away, that the nature of this planet is changing, and we want to be ready. So bless us to this end, because we've asked it in Jesus' mighty name, and all the people said together, amen. amen.